Taking part in some of these programs and, and watching the others, I've been reminded that it is actually over 20 years since I first heard you expound some of the matter which you've been going into in great detail about how to do Shakespeare. And like the rest of us, in the intervening two decades, I've not only worked with you, but uh, come to be very grateful to you for the productions of Shakespeare, which I've not been in, of yours, which I've seen. And we are privileged, and uh, many of your viewers will not be as privileged because they won't have seen your productions. So everything you've been saying of an academic nature and of a detailed nature, uh, uh, I've been able to measure against your achievements as a director in the theatre and the achievements of the actors who've worked for you. Uh, I wonder if uh, some of the viewers are thinking, uh, why did John Bart never come into the theatre at all? Why didn't he stay at Cambridge and be uh, the most brilliant academic and write books on this subject? Why didn't he start a drama school? Why didn't he become a critic and chastise everybody who wasn't doing it like he was? And yet I know you're devoted to the theatre. And uh, I wonder if you could just, along those lines, tell us what it is about the theatre which, which keeps your adrenaline running uh, and makes you want to e go even deeper into this sort of background which will help you to make what are often marvellous productions. I think, in a way, it's the reason why we're making these programmes, which is that I've been asked to write a book about Shakespeare and I refused because I thought that you could only talk about the problems of acting Shakespeare by doing it with living actors. And my love of Shakespeare, which is certainly great when I read him, is always leading me to seeing, let it be done with actors. Let's see what happens when it's brought alive by actors because it's so incomplete, when it's just a text on the stage. On the other hand, sometimes I think, well, maybe it's all quite impossible because when we do work, when we dig, as we've been doing in these programmes, we analyse, we argue, we rootle around, and we learn so much about what goes on in that text. But, of course, then, when we do it, I always feel a bit of a sense of failure because we can't put into the work more than a fraction of the things that we talk about and dig for. And uh, I think failure is the important thing to talk about in this programme because otherwise we set ourselves up as high priests, which we're not. We do our best, but we only bring before the audience a fraction of the things that we've learnt or think we've learnt in rehearsal. And I suppose I feel a particular sense of failure when I talk about Shakespeare's poetry. It's a problem that's haunted me over the years and which I've never really solved. When I read a Shakespeare text, I'm moved and stirred by the power and the resonance of individual lines. The poet Hausmann described the effect to him of recalling a line of poetry when he was shaving. Experience has taught me to keep watch over my thoughts, because if a line of poetry strays into my memory, my skin bristles so that the razor ceases to act. Unfortunately, audiences don't shave in the theatre, but shouldn't they be thrilled by poetry just as Hausmann was? Shouldn't our senses be stirred by the language? Yet nothing I've said so far about marrying our two traditions, Elizabethan and modern, necessarily helps to bring about what I can both hear and I can feel in the lines as I read them. I can talk about intentions and the rhythm and the key words and the situation and all that, all the things that we've looked at, and yet I feel I'm missing something, and in rehearsal, I often don't know what to say or how to help the actor. Well, what about just saying to them, as uh, somebody said in Alice in Wonderland, uh, 
look after the sense and the sounds will look after themselves. Well, that's comforting words to an actor. <coughs> but are we sure that they're true? I mean, I think that they're good counsel for starting the work. But I'm not sure that they take you all the way. But what do you think? I think, uh, I think it's, uh, it's fair enough. Um, as far as uh, the question of comprehension is concerned, you need to comprehend, obviously, as well as you can, <laughs> what the lines mean. I think that where the other aspect of the sounds or the, the textures, the rhythms, um, are to do with this other question, which is perhaps we don't quite understand so well today, which is the word apprehension mm. as opposed to comprehension. And I think that apprehension to the Elizabethans was a very palpable form of being um, sensually highly aware um, of... Uh, as I say, rhythm, sound, texture, as a way of combining with comprehension to bring about um, a factor which goes beyond just the sense. That's a very good. kind of X, some something, quality. Something like music which would accompany wonderful lyrics, say. Yes. Yes. We're, we're, yes. we're sort of talking about an acting sixth sense, which isn't to do with analysing or the mind. It's something that we have to feel about those lines. And it takes place only in the time in which it takes place. I mean, that right. it, it lives as it dies, or it dies as it lives. But it's only... how can we work on it? How can we mm. find our way with it? That's the problem. I'm talking particularly about text which is poetic and yet not obviously heightened. Now, that's saying something I haven't raised so far. There's often a kind of hidden poetry in seemingly simple, unpoetic lines, which is easy to overlook and quite different from the overt poetry which we find in rich and heightened language. Just listen to the line we began the series with. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. Good. Now, what Ian caught then, and what I didn't point out at the time because we were looking at other things, was that besides being a naturalistic line on the surface, it also has a poetic ring, uneasy, haunting and resonant, though it's hard to put into words of quite what. That happens very often with Shakespeare's monosyllabic lines. Here's a prose example, all but one word of it are monosyllables. Ask for me tomorrow, and you shall find me a grave man. When Lear awakens from his madness, he says, You do me wrong to take me out of the grave. Thou art a soul in bliss, but I am bound upon a wheel of fire that mine own tears do scald like molten lead. Thirty-five words, and all but two are monosyllables. Grave, bliss, fire. Now, in All's Well, but Ends Well, the Countess talks about what it's like to be in love. Even so it was with me when I was young. If ever we are natures, these are ours. This form doth to our rose of youth rightly belong. Our blood to us, this to our blood is born. It is the show and seal of nature's truth where love's strong passion is impressed in youth. By the remembrances of days foregone, such were our faults, though then we thought them none. 71 words, and again, all but eight are monosyllables. Shakespeare often uses monosyllabic lines for particularly charged or heightened moments. They need air. They need to go more slowly than the other lines that tend to do so naturally. Polysyllables trip easily off the tongue, characterization, repudiation, and so on. Monosyllabic lines and words are packed with thoughts and feelings. You actually can't rush them. So just try taking one or two monosyllabic lines very fast and then see what happens with them. In Sutra, I know why I, I, I am so sad. You do me wrong to take me out of the grave. It struts and frets his heart upon the stage. Even so, it was with me when I was young. There, yeah, you, you can't do it, can you? <laughs> so, let's go back to Antonio again, slowly. In sooth, I know not 
why I am so sad. Good. Now, one of the difficulties of this line is that it's a difficult moment for Antonio. He doesn't know why he's so sad. So he's feeling for something, but he himself doesn't quite know what it is. I suppose that's why it's a poetic line. So each of you take the line, one off to the other, and see if you can't search it, feel for it, and disturb me poetically in some way like Ian was doing. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. Good. Well, I think something you was captured and caught there, because you were actually doing something that you don't normally do in the theatre, and yet it's perhaps valuable. Do you really believe that old ghost about reading Shakespeare being better than, uh, than seeing it on the stage? Well, I think it's a ghost that's got some blood in it. Perhaps we should read Shakespeare to ourselves more often when we're rehearsing him. Perhaps there's a moral in that. It touches on something that we don't think about when we're worrying about character and moves and situation and plotting. Here's a literary man writing just 50 years ago of Constance's love and grief for her dead son Arthur in King John. Of nature's gifts that mayst with lilies boast and with the half-blown rose. Oh, bother that half-blown rose. Its beauty blurs my eyes and I can hardly go on quoting. Grief fills the room up of my absent child, lies in his bed, walks up and down with me, puts on his pitied look. So where's my handkerchief? I can't quote anymore. <laughs> well, we can laugh at him. And indeed, I suppose he's half laughing at himself. But isn't he at bottom right in what he's expressing there? Don't the lines move you just a little just by listening to them, even out of context? And if the feeling is there in reading, shouldn't we try to recapture it if we can in the theatre? And don't we sometimes give short shrift with poetry? In the old days, directors used to tell the actor how to do the line and, and what the tune was, and it still happens sometimes. I mean, I remember with, with you, oh yes, I remember, when I first started, you used to do it to me all the time, tell me how to say a line, because I, I got the inflection or things like that wrong. And do, you, do you believe in that? Well, I'm very half and half about it. Sometimes I think it's a good thing, sometimes I think it's a terrible thing. I'm tempted to it often, but I suspect it because I think the prejudice against it in the modern theatre is healthy because it makes the actor a mimic. He'd be playing a set tune rather than spontaneous intentions and wouldn't feel real. Anyway, I'm always doubtful. Why should I think that I can do it better? But I'm never quite sure about it. What do you think? Well, it's interesting that that's uh, Hamlet's kind of, I suppose, instructions to the players. Um, but then perhaps that was Hamlet. I wonder whether Hamlet would have made the same instructions to a set of players at the end of the play that he makes so certainly at the beginning. And does it perhaps uh, suggest something that the quality of, a, I think, a director should indeed be able to have the ability to explain as well as possible, but must always, I think, allow actors to be in a, feel in a secure enough atmosphere that they can experiment. And similarly, the director will want to do that as well. Uh, so that in fact, something new can be found. I mean, I think that if everybody followed Hamlet's instructions absolutely all the time, half his plays would have fallen by the wayside in a curious way. I mean, I don't think that they apply absolutely to the letter all the way through. And even then, they're open to a kind of interpretation. So I think a balance is really the thing that should happen. I think that's and... sage counsel. Once again, <clears throat> you're using our key word, which is balance. One can tip it too far one way, tip it too far the other. Always got to balance. Let's now take a bit of prose, which certainly contains hidden poetry, a dialogue which we've heard before between Falstaff and Doll Tear Sheet from King Henry the Fourth, Part Two. Thou wholesome little tidy Bartholomew boar pig. When wilt thou leave fighting a days and finding a nights, and patch up thine old body for heaven? Peace, good darling. Do not speak like a death's head. Do not bid me remember mine end. Sarah. What humours the prince on? Mm, he's a good shallow young fellow. 
made of a pantlan with a chipped bread well. They'd say Poins has a good wit. Yeah, good wit. <laughs> Hang him, baboon. <laughs> His wit's as thick as Dukesbury mustard. <laughs> Why does the prince love him so, then? Because our legs are both of a bigness. He plays it quite well. He eats conger and fennel. He drinks candles in for flat dragons. <laughs> <laughs> Rides with the wild bear with the boys. Jumps upon joint stools. Swears with good grace. Wears his boots pretty smooth. <laughs> like unto the sign of the leg. Another gamble faculties. Is that show a weak mind and an able body? For to which the prince admits him. And the prince himself is such another. Kiss me, Darl. Let us give me fluttering buses. Oh, by my troth, I kiss thee with the most constant heart. I am old. I love thee more than I love e'er a scurvy young boy of them all. What stuff would have a kirtle of? I shall receive money at Thursday. I shall have a cap tomorrow. <laughs> a merry song. Come. It grows late. Forget me when I'm gone. By my trust, thou set me a weeping, and thou speak'st so. Prove that ever I dress handsome till thy return. <sighs> Hearken at the end. Thank you. Well, what's the poetic bit? Just listen again to three lines. A plays at coits well, and eats conger and fennel, and drinks off candles' ends for flap dragons, and rides the wild mare with the boys. Drinking off candles' ends for flap dragons means trying to drink out of a tankard with a lit candle in it, and trying to drink it without putting the candle out. But aren't these phrases poetic? Don't they say more than the things they actually describe? This is an easier example than in sooth I know not, because it's textually stranger and richer. Now, a really hard example of a poetic line. There's a line of Amelia's at the end of Othello, which haunts me. It can easily pass by unnoticed, but it sends a shiver through me in the way Hausman describes. Othello has killed his wife Desdemona, and Iago's treachery is being found out. Amelia, Iago's wife, has discovered that he's been saying Desdemona went to bed with Cassio, and the pressure is on. She, false with Cassio. Did you say with Cassio? With Cassio, mistress, go to charm your tongue. I will not charm my tongue. I am bound to speak. My mistress here lies murdered in her bed. Oh, heaven forfend. And your reports have set the murder on. Nay, stir not, masters. Tis true, indeed. Villainy, villainy, villainy. I think upon it, I think I smelt. Oh, villainy. I thought so then I'll kill myself with grief. Oh, villainy, villainy. But are you mad? I charge you, get you home. Good masters, let me have leave to speak. Tis proper I obey him, but not now. Perchance, Siago, I will ne'er go home. Well, you can probably guess it. The line that moves me very powerfully is the last line. Perchance, Siago, I will ne'er go home. How can I explain it? In the general turmoil, it comes suddenly as a still line where Amelia's emotion is channeled into a single thought 
She stands outside herself, partly because she's standing up to her husband Iago for the first time in her life, and partly because she subconsciously senses that he is about to kill her. So the line is ambiguous. It means, I won't go home with you, and it means, I'm going to die. Now, let's listen again to Queen Margaret in King Richard III talking to the widow of the dead King Edward IV. The speech is also about time. Oh, thou didst prophesy that time would come, that I would wish for thee to help me curse that bottled spider, that foul bunched back toad. I called thee then, vain flourish of my fortune. I called thee then, poor shadow, painted queen, a presentation of but what I was, a sign of dignity, a breath, a bubble, a queen in show, only to dress the scene. Where is thy husband now? Where be thy brothers? Where are thy two sons? Wherein dost thou joy? Who sues to thee and cries, God save the queen? Where are the bending peers that flattered thee? Where be the thronging troops that followed thee? Decline all this and see what now thou art. For happy wife, a most distressed widow, a joyful mother, one that wails the name, for one that sued to, one that humbly sues, for queen, a very caitiff crowned with care. Thus hath the course of justice whirled about and left thee but a very prey to time. Sometimes Shakespeare at once sees both good and ill in time. It's an enemy and yet a friend. So let's look at another non-dramatic piece which sums that up. Let's take a bit of The Rape of Lucrece, which hardly anybody knows. Alan, share the lines with us all. Tell us about your old friend. You know him, you love him, and you fear him, and above all, you accept him. It's not just text, it's your experience. Alan's. Time's glory is to calm contending kings, to unmask falsehood and bring truth to light, to stamp the seal of time in aged things, to wake the morn and sentinel the night, to wrong the wronger till he render right, to ruinate proud buildings with thy hours and smear with dust their glittering golden towers. To fill with wormholes stately monuments, to feed oblivion with decay of things, to blot old books and alter their contents, to pluck the quills from ancient raven's wings, to dry the old oak sap and cherish springs, to spoil antiquities of hammered steel, and turn the giddy round of fortune's wheel. To show the beldam daughters of her daughter, to make the child a man, the man a child. To slay the tiger that doth live by slaughter, to tame the unicorn and lion wild, to mock the subtle in themselves beguiled. To cheer the plowman with increased crops, and waste huge stones with little water drops. Sometimes Shakespeare addresses time as if it's almost a character, not something impersonal, but somebody he knows. His feelings about his old friend and enemy are constantly shifting. Sometimes he accepts time, and sometimes he's defiant. Devouring time, blunt thou the lion's paw, and let the earth devour her own sweet brood. Pluck the keen teeth from the fierce tiger's jaw and drown the living phoenix in her blood. Make glad and sorry seasons as thou fleetst and do whate'er thou wilt, swift-footed time with the wide world and all her fading sweets. But I forbid thee one most heinous crime, 
Oh, carve not with thine hours my love's fair brow, nor draw no lines there with thine antique pen. Him in thy course untainted do allow for beauty's pattern to succeeding men. Yet do thy worst, old time, whate'er thy wrong, my love shall in my verse ever live young. Perhaps we're cheating by taking two non-dramatic bits. So let's go back to a key point we made earlier. Sometimes an actor has at the same time to be in character and yet stand outside his situation and his character. Let's take one of the most loaded examples of all. In Julius Caesar, Brutus is talking to the dead body of Cassius, his friend. The last of all the Romans, fare thee well. It is impossible that ever Rome should breed thy fellow. Friends, I owe more tears to this dead man than you shall see me pay. I shall find time, Cassius. I shall find time. Oh, that was lovely. And that last line, you made that sing poetically, I think. What do you feel and think about time at the moment that you say it? Well, it's hard to divorce what one feels and thinks about time at that moment, of course, from the information that has accumulated throughout the event mm. uh, of playing the role. But the clues I get off the page are um, short, monosyllabic almost, impossible is one of the largest, uh, the longest words in the whole section, um, relentless um, driving force of this speech. He doesn't give himself um, time for grief. The, the writing doesn't allow you time for grief. But I think the last line, I, um, Shakespeare allows the character by repetition to take himself by surprise because I think I shall find time when first said is quite genuine. And then when it's said again, is totally ironic, of course, because it's too late to find time. That's right. And the second one probably has death resonating in it already. That's right. It's the problem of ambiguity again, isn't mm. it? You're trying to reach out to Cassius with your love, but also, like Amelia, you're thinking about your own death. So it's yes. about two things. Yes. Maybe, amongst other things, you're mocking yourself for all your high aspirations in the play, which have come to nothing. I think that um, there is a danger if without, without the, the information of the play helping you, to try and compress too many um, objectives into those four or five lines will we'll, we'll neutralise, they'll start to neutralise one another. It's, it's, right. it's very hard, actually, to hold, to hold abstract information in your head um, if you haven't got the accumulated information to, to feed right. on. In other words, if the rest of Brutus has been a washout, you're not going to find <laughs> your way out of it uh, on these lines. They're not, you're not going to find any help yes, at all. It's always dangerous to dig too deep and think of too many things, but the line's got to mean so many things there. I mean, Shakespeare yes, is asking us... Oh, yes. ..to be moved and to be questioning With time. With sparse, and... sparse, short words as well. That's right. I mean, and in a way, you have to trust, trust the poetry and let it carry you. You can't worry about it while you're doing the line, or should you? I think you've got to let go, but trust... The, 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 it's rather like pouring molten metal into a mould that Shakespeare has made for you, providing your metal is hot enough. Uh, the mould will work, but if it's not, it won't. I, I'm, I'm torn when I listen to that, because I thought you did it marvellously, and yet one bit of me was wanting to say, get more out of it, get more out of it, but maybe I mustn't say too much, because you can only take so much into it at a time. Well, let, let me hear it. I mean, I would like to hear it. Uh, um, I find often that things are... The objective side of a speech is unlocked. When I hear somebody else say it, it remains subjective, if I, and I mustn't listen to myself yeah. anyway because it's a false exercise. So there's Cassius, John, yeah. and uh, there's there's Brutus. So let me let me hear you do it. It would help me if you could do that. Well, I've got to talk to the cloak this yes, time. Yes, you have. It's All a right. good cloak. It looked after me very well. My old friend <laughs> Cassius. <laughs> <coughs> the last of all the Romans. Fare thee well. It is impossible that ever Rome should breed thy fellow. 
Friends, I owe more tears to this dead man than you shall see me pay. I shall find time, Cassius. I shall find time. Let's, let's take another word now. Let's, let's take death. But this time we'll do it in a jolly way and we'll take a prose bit rather than a verse bit, but it's going to be poetic prose. It's also a, pa a passage built on the resonance of one single word. Here we have old Justice Shallow in Henry IV talking to his even older friend, Silence. Oh, Jesu. Jesu. The mad days that I've spent and to see how many of mine old acquaintance are dead. Oh. Oh. We shall all follow, cousin. Oh, certainly. It is certainly very sure. Death, as the psalmist says, comes to all. All shall die. How a good yoke of bullocks at Stamford Fair. Oh, by my troth, I was not there. Death is certain. <laughs> is old double of your town living yet? Dead, sir. Did you, did Dead. I drew a good bow and dead. I shot a fine shoot. John of Gaunt loved him well and betted much money on his head. Dead. He would have clapped in the clout and carried you a forehand shaft of fourteen and a fourteen and a half. It would have done a man's heart good to see. How a score of yous now? Thereafter as maybe. A score of good yous may be worth ten pounds. And his old double dead. Good, I, I enjoyed that, but I want to do it again. I want to push it one step further, because you were both so old that you were in your <laughs> graves, and you were dead. The, the, the paradox, I think, and the fun of this scene for Shallow is that though he's very old and senile, he doesn't know he is, and he's full of life, and he's got a terrific manic energy and zest, and part of the fun of the scene is old silence, who's slow coach and ponderous, like a great bovine creature but Shallow has a sort of manic energy about him, though it's a senile energy. So try it again. Uh, it's one of the troubles with parts which are quite short, uh, that uh, yeah. you try and make them rather long by putting a lot of pauses. Yes. Mm. <laughs> yes. Um, but let me, let me put it another way, then. I you've speak, got, I you've got you've got to earn the golden moments, haven't yes, you? There's true. got to be a basic manic energy so that you can break through with the really important lines uh, and the realisation of death when it comes. But do you, do you think that Shallow by the end is relating uh, the fact that Double has died to the fact that he is himself going to die? Or is he actually absolutely thrilled that he's outlived old Double? I think that he's thrilled of his own living, but realises on the very last his old Double dead, his own yes. death, but not till then. Yes, all right. OK, have another go. <coughs> Death is certain. <laughs> is old double of your town living yet? Dead, sir. Oh, jeez, you, jeez, you. Dead? He drew a good bow. But dead, he shot a fine shoot. John O'Gaunt loved him well and betted much money on his head. Dead? <laughs> he would have clapped at the clout of twelve score and carried you a forehead and shot a fourteen and a fourteen and a half that it would have done a man's heart good to see. How a score of yous now? There are, there is maybe. 
a score of good use may be worth ten pounds. And his old double dead. That was great. It was great. It, it, it reminded me of a point we made right at the beginning about how Shakespeare makes these sudden changes. You go from <coughs> a yoke of bullets at Stamford Fair, which is on a bouncy level, and suddenly the reality of death the next moment. It's these sudden jagged gear changes which we have to embrace. And of course for the Elizabethans, death was uh, an ever-present fact of life in a way. With our modern medicine, of course, death is at the end of something rather long that's preceded it, but death was that's more right. frequent uh, fact that one could see in the streets. And, uh... That's right. In all these examples, we've tried, I think, to hang on to our basic starting point in the whole series, that the intention must be rightly found. That's the first step, but we've found this evening that it won't take us all the way, and there's a sort of leap in the dark to be made on bits of text like this. It's a leap in the dark because we can't, certainly I can't, quite articulate the answer, though one may sometimes sense it, or as Alan puts it, it's a sixth sense that we reach is for. So we've talked of two kinds of failure so far, but perhaps there is a third. Somehow, sometimes, after doing a bit of good work, we like to think we've solved the way of approaching Shakespeare and that we do it better than it used to be done supposed to be a modern way of doing Shakespeare, which is sometimes coupled with the name of our company. But I suspect it's not so new as we sometimes like to think. I wonder what playing Shakespeare was like 50 years ago and what it'll be like 50 years hence. I'm sure that what we do now, what we're doing tonight, will be mocked as we sometimes mock what we hear of the old actors. Yet the past seems to me to be full of contradictions. First, let's listen to Henry Ainley playing Othello in 1938. Cold, my girl, even like thy chastity. Oh, curse it. Curse such slave. Whip me, ye devils, from the possession of this heavenly sight. Blow me about in winds. Roast me in sulphur. Wash me in steep down gulfs of liquid fire. Oh, Desdemona, Desdemona, Des. Oh. 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 <laughs> yes, we can hear and we can laugh and give ourselves a pat on the back. But now listen to a recording of Viola made in the 1940s. I left me a ring with her. What means this lady? Fortune forbid my outside have not charmed her. She made good view of me. Indeed, so much that sure me thought her eyes had lost her tongue, for she did speak and stop distractedly. She loves me, sure. The cunning of her passion invites me in this churlish messenger. None of my lord's ring, why he sent her none. I am the man. Peggy, you recorded that 35 years ago, but it doesn't sound like it to me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> anyway, your experience of Shakespeare is much greater and richer than mine. Does the way that we play him now seem very different from the way you knew it in the theatre? Oh, John, what a question. Terrible. It's simply huge because... Um, well, first of all, I just must make a little comment about... Henry Ainley's excerpt, because that is said to be made in 1938. But in 1932, I recorded the whole of Othello with him, and he didn't do it like that at all. And I have a feeling, you see, I mean, he, he did belong to another era, let's face that. But I think we today, there is not such a great difference. But if I might take you up on your favourite theme, time... I could use it in two senses. In one way, how lucky we are today that we have time. We have seven weeks rehearsal. In those days, we had three, four if we were very, very lucky. Now that time in that sense, I think, makes an enormous difference. But to try and uh, divide 
the approach to acting, which I maintain is always the same with all actors who are really true actors, is very difficult. You can't put it into decades. I mean, you can listen to Henry Ainley in 1938. Then I remember back in 1920 seeing the most miraculous, the first modern dress Hamlet done by the Birmingham Repertory Theatre, which I shall always remember, which was very, very much at the same time as seeing John Barrymore play Hamlet at the Haymarket, which I thought even then was disaster. So I don't think time makes all that difference. I think of, well, the production of, John Gielgud's production of Romeo and Juliet, where I think the approach was very much as we make it now, although we only had, a, we had fewer weeks. This was the one you did in the 30s. In the 30s, where now we had Edith, who had the most wonderful delivery of Shakespearean verse, I think, learnt from that master, William Powell. There was John with his older tradition of perfect speaking of verse, but with that marvellous sense of uh, phrasing that's almost unequalled. And Larry, who, who's, who was in a sense the most of an innovator, who was after, above all, character. And that's where I think we all, as actors, merge, don't you think I think so? so. I do. Yes, some, if you take some of John Gielgud's uh, recordings of the 30s, mm. they're almost, almost as dated as the only one, aren't they? Not as much, of course, nowhere near, but they are dated today. Yes. I mean, but he's grown with it. Yes. And it is a question of style of a period, isn't it? And I can't believe that that one of Ainley was done in 1938. I'm sure it's older than that. Well, because... you see, he might have been lured into a studio, mightn't he, and done a rather ham... Quite. Version of I that remember speech. hearing him during the war recording um, on the radio doing Les, Les Miserables. Mm. Saying, Cosette. Uh, yes. It's really over the top. Um, it was extraordinary, isn't it? But, uh, but so many of those older actors, it's unfortunate, isn't it? They're in a way recorded. And I think it's very unfortunate that any of us are recorded, us John. Yeah. You, yes, you're it, responsible for. We I, should I, be he, held up. He didn't have the experience of being in a studio like this ever in his life. Yes, yes and I keep being filled with the melancholy thought that when we're looked at in years to come, <laughs> we'll seem quite as strange as Ainley does to us now. I'm sure so we, we mustn't I'm laugh sure too much. No. But on the other hand, if you look at old films of actors, I think the film of uh, Forbes Robertson's 1911 Hamlet, there are some performances in it that are so awful, it just isn't true. But he himself mm. is marvellous, absolutely marvellous. And the, the, the film of, uh, of um, Duzan, wonderful. Could be shot yesterday. But what really you're saying to us when you tell us about the 30s is that the sometimes made assumption today that our company, the RSC, found a new style with Shakespeare just isn't true. No, we I picked don't up think an existing true. tradition. And built on it. Because yeah. I think all theatre is continuity, don't you? Yes. I do. It's moved but, forward the whole time. But I, I, I think what you said a few minutes ago about time is very right, because we do have a long time to work now, and you used to have less time, but the Elizabethan actors who started the whole thing off had virtually no time. Mm. What we know of their conditions is that they learned their lines and put the play on. How they did it, God knows. Well, we've been learning a bit of that today, haven't yeah. we? Yes. And, of course, when we have... To, time and too much time, we dig a bit too much and yes. we try to be too clever and try to do too much with it. So it's an awful salutary warning, I think. Let me ask you one naive, obvious, but important question. What to you is the most important thing to go for in acting Shakespeare? Well, I think it's too simple to say the truth. It's, it is partly the truth, what do we mean by truth? Truth of reality, poetry, which is a little bit of super reality, and character, and it's the fusion of poetry, truth and character, that is required in extreme in Shakespeare. Reality, poetry, Character. Mm. It's 
three balls that but we have to have juggle to with yeah. all the time, throw them up, and if one goes up too far, the others suffer, and if we can, one goes too high, we drop the other two. And I think it's true to say, don't you, I think we'd all agree that, that it's like the um, hen and the egg. You see, you, you can appreciate a line, but it's no good thinking you know how to say the line until you've found the character. And Shakespeare's drawn the character, and we have to find that character. And only when we have found the character are we able to say the line as it should be said, not by everybody or anybody, but by us, because we've made that particular character. That's right. So it has to fit with that, and then it comes out natural. Well, that's why I haven't really talked about poetry till this last final yeah. programme. We looked at it first in terms of character, and I think poetry has to come last in the queue for acting, even though in the end it may be the most important thing. It's not the thing the actor can start with. But, oh, dear, it's so hard, isn't it? Those three balls in the air. All work on Shakespeare's just like that. We never do him justice. What we think's good and splendid at one moment is only true for that moment. We go too far one way or the other. Are too heightened, too naturalistic. Too hot, too cool. Too quick, too slow. Yes, the list is endless. But as we've covered so much ground, I suppose I should try to sum up and say what are the key points or what are the golden rules, if there are any. I hate generalizations, but we'll have a go. We've talked of possibilities, not rules. Of questions, balances, not absolutes. So are there any rules? Yes, there are. Try to find what goes on in the text and ask yourselves if you can use it. You must not reject it until you've smelt it out and asked the questions. Never forget the verse is there to help you. It can be heightened, and yet very often, it's close to our own humdrum human speech. We often use it, but we never notice. Which of you noticed while I have been talking that what I've just said was in bad blank verse? Shouldn't we end then by taking uh, a crucial bit of Shakespeare and, well, just listening to him? Yes, I think we should. And the obvious emotional farewell for any Shakespeare programme is Prospero's much-quoted speech after the mask in The Tempest. Now, this is often being worked and used out of context and debased as an anthology piece, and taken by itself, it can easily be sentimental. But I think it's relevant here and good to end with because it does catch something of the elusiveness we've been talking about about any theatrical performance. Shakespeare was an actor, and he knew as well as we do that playing him could never entirely do him justice. They say, this is his farewell to the theater. You do look, my son, in a moved sort, as if you were dismayed. Be cheerful, sir. Our revels now are ended, and these, our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. We hardly ever know what Shakespeare himself really thinks about it all, but let's just listen once again to a bit of Hamlet's advice to the players. To speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of our players do, I had as lief the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand, thus. For anything so or done is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and last, was and is 
to hold as twere the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. Now, let me make a personal choice. I'd like to end with another passage we've already looked at, because so much that we've talked about can be found in it. It's not an obvious example, but it stirs me, and I love it. It's the little dialogue in Troilus and Cressida between Ulysses and Hector. They're both looking at the walls and towers of Troy. I wonder now how yonder city stands when we have here her base and pillar by us. Sir, I know your favor, Lord Ulysses, well. Ah, sir, there's many a Greek and Trojan dead since first I saw yourself and Diomed in Aelian on your Greekish embassy. Sir, I foretold you then what would ensue, for yonder walls that pertly front your town, yon towers whose wanton tops do bust the clouds, must kiss their own feet. I must not believe you. There they stand yet, and modestly, I think, the fall of every Phrygian stone will cost a drop of Grecian blood. The end crowns all, and that old common arbitrator, time, will one day end it. So, to him we leave it. Thank you.